I've been, I've been a human rights activist for as long as I can remember. Um, you know, I followed in the footsteps of, of my father, who um, was very active on the anti-racist scene in the UK. Um, <laughs> So I think, you know, working, being a part of the women's movement from a young age and then working as a frontline worker, like Rahila said, working for Southall Black Sisters, I head up a women's organisation um, in the Midlands, in England, um, and doing that work with uh, women who are experiencing domestic violence, sexual violence, who are trafficked, um, who are trapped in domestic servitude. So we offer a range of services to them as, as an organisation, but I think there's also... Um, writing and being political and being part of debates and raising the issues that impact upon um, all women. Mm. So making sure that we're raising the specificities that impact upon um, women of, of immigrant backgrounds. And what are um, the, those but specificities? But also the commonalities. Yeah, exactly, because I, I can imagine that if women are in an abusive situation, yeah. does, it, does it matter, I wonder, does it matter whether they're of colour, whether they're black or whether they're white? I think it does, because I think the patriarchy manifests itself in so many different ways. Um, and the justifications for that exertion of male power and male control um, mm. you know, is used in, in very different ways. So um, whilst you may have a, a white woman who is experiencing physical violence from a man who thinks he um, you know, should hold the power in the family, will have that commonality with, with her, her non-white sister, but it's the use of culture, it's the use of religion, it's the use of tradition and rules like we heard in, in the film earlier, which I think there needs to be an understanding of and mm. where I guess um, in some families you've had that move towards the nuclear family and the perpetrator will be just the husband. Mm. Um, where we've got um, families from minority backgrounds, you've also got multiple perpetrators or potentially multiple perpetrators. Um, and, you know, I mean, like I said, the patriarchy will use any justification it can find in order to, um, you know, retain its, its superior position. Right, the cultural justification, so, yeah. so to speak. Jimmy, you agreed on that. Would you like to add on that as well? So I don't think many people know this, but like I, uh, well, the second part of what I'm going to say. So the first part is I grew up in a Pakistani house in um, London in a, in a South Asian community, and there was a lot of domestic violence in my house, actually, and it was directed towards my mother and sometimes my sisters. Um, and I was really struggling as a child to, to make sense of what was happening in my house. How is this violence taking place? And the community isn't intervening. Uh, the police, when they come, don't seem to be doing anything, but are treating it as a family sort of matter. And then I think at the age of 18 or 19, God knows how this book landed in my lap, which was called Against the Grain, and it was by um, Southall Black Sisters. And I remember reading this book, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is what is happening in my house. Like when it started talking about honor culture and the way that my sisters and my mum's behavior um, was reflecting uh, on the whole community at large, but particularly on uh, my brothers and on my dad. Um, and I think just to link back to what you were saying, in that actually that, that, that concept of honor culture is very different to something you would find within our white counterparts. It would be absence from, uh, from, from their dialogue. Mm. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's, really, it's really important to have this focus on just our uh, groups because there are some very definite distinctions mm. in terms of how and why things manifest. Right. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming an LGBTQ activist? So I think before I was a, a I, I guess I see myself more as a human rights activist rather than just LGBT rights. Um, and because of the, the environment I grew up with, my human rights activism was really based around what is happening with women in my community. As I stepped more and more into my sexuality, uh, there were some commonalities actually there that um, also bring my human rights activity into the LGBT community. So one of these is... Not to cut you off, but just, just a quick question. How did you know that that pattern that you witnessed at home, that, that for you wasn't the norm or that, you had, that that was something you had to rebel against because it was something that you grew up in? Where did you find that um, insight that it was something that you couldn't agree against with? Against the grain. Yeah, against <laughs> the, the grain. Was it, was it so because of I the I think book? before Against the Grain, uh, as a child, you know, looking at the treatment of my brothers and myself compared to what my sisters and my mum were allowed to do, mm. there was this huge disparity between the way that me and my brothers could go out and come home 
compared to my sisters? Uh, where, where, where are you going? What time are you going to be back? Are there going to be any boys there? Uh, the, 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 the boys in my family went to mixed uh, schools. My sisters had to go to all girls' schools. Did your brothers notice that as well? Um, yes, they seemed less bothered by it than I was. I think maybe you either accept this is just the way things are, um, or maybe you rebel against it and you think you know it's a, it's a real injustice. Mm. I, I think also, depending on how much you're probably reading as a kid as well and what sorts of stuff you're reading, mm. will influence the way that you uh, challenge injustice or accept it as this is just the way it is. So, for example, I'd ask questions like, how comes my sister can't do this, and I'd be given a response, because she's a girl. And I'd be waiting for the rest of that sentence, <laughs> and then realized, oh my god, that's your reason. It's like, just because she's a girl, and then you've put a full stop there. Hmm. Um, and my brothers would be satiated by that uh, explanation, and then began using that as, a, as an explanation as well. And the other thing, the real disparities all that I saw was, my sisters weren't hijabis, like nobody in my house wore a hijab but there was a definite policing of what they wore. Like their clothing would have to be uh, covering their body. Mm. And nobody ever really paid attention to what I wore or what my brothers wore. Mm. So this sense of injustice was what got me thinking more critically. And then against the grain and um, mm. yeah, any such feminist narratives really made me see what was happening in my house and how and that, had, that had a commonality as well with you uh, realising your sexuality. And, and what happened from there on? Did you yeah. express your sexuality within the family right away, or did you, how did you go about it? Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, so my family found out I was gay when I was about 23, and I got disowned for about 10 years. Um, but I think, just to give you an example, I think we, sometimes we can get quite intellectual. So to maybe bring it to a specific a specific example is I've been spending a lot of time with the concept of shame at the moment and how when I was growing up you know and I, I'd ask about what is it okay to be gay or is it not okay to be gay uh, and you might ask in the mosque or you might ask a family member uh, and you'd always be hit back or well, Islam says no and actually gay people should be executed under Sharia law uh, and then there'd be an entire dialogue about how to kill the gay person like should you decapitate him should you hang him should you stone him should you burn him you know that was quite a fringe um, perspective uh, so there was this whole conversation about how to kill gay people and, and this internalized shame started taking mm -hmm. place but now as a, as a man who set steps more and more into uh, the pride of being a, a gay man and actually uh, my authentic self and living with integrity and mm -hmm. embracing who I am. The shame that was directed at me mm -hmm. by my community is now directed towards my family even more. Mm -hmm. So as I escape from the confines of shame, yeah. it's still impacting me because my mother is made to feel ashamed that her son is so proud of being who he is. Mm. And when I look at that experience of shame and I look for commonalities within my community, what I see is that women who try to live an independent life within my community, women who decide, actually, I don't want to get married and I just want to live by myself, or I want to date, or I want to choose my own husband, or I want to have sex before marriage, that same web of shame mm -hmm. is the one that ensnares them. And right. so we have this common experience of shame. Right. Uh, it's just directed at us by the wider community. But how do you deal that on a practical level? I mean, do you connect mm. with them and do you don't connect with them at all? Yeah, I think so. I think conversations like this are really important because actually, um, and, and this was about, ties into the conversation about identity politics, is often that can be a narrowing and a, 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 a decreasing size of identity. Like, actually, you're not a gay man, so you can't speak about shame in this way. But actually, what I'm more interested in is uh, collaboration mm. and looking at actually this is my experience of shame what is that experience like for you as a, uh, as a, a woman of Muslim heritage mm. or what is it like for you as a, a gay man who is white mm. what was your experience of shame and I think if we use identity politics in that way where we're looking for collaboration and commonality mm. and we're building bridges um, and I think it, historically it was used in that way that's a great way to use it mm. however I think there is there is an ability to misuse any tool. So if you think about identity politics as a tool, and then we look at how it's being misused, I can give you a couple of hideous examples. So Gita mentioned the Inclusive Mosque Initiative yesterday, uh, which is like an LGBT-friendly uh, mosque. They include everybody in their, uh, in their practice. And so a bunch of ex-Muslims thought on Eid will go down to uh, their event and show solidarity and support 
bad idea. I don't know who came up with that idea. It might have been me. So, um, <laughs> so we went down there, and the opening, uh, the, the female imam who opened the talk said, if you're a white man, consider your privilege and how much space you're taking up here. And there were white men in, in, in the room. Uh, and then after the prayer, the a lady who did the khutbah, like the sermon, she mentioned white men about three times in really disparaging and quite frankly racist ways. And, uh, and you know, it was quite abhorrent to be sat there watching somebody just criticizing uh, white males, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and so after, after that, we spoke to the lady who gave the, the sermon, and we said to her, actually, that was really quite uncomfortable, and uh, it just seems like you're targeting one group of people in, in the room. Uh, and she didn't really have a, a way to, to combat that. And we pointed out that actually, as a, as a gay-friendly mosque, you're holding your event in the basement of a hotel. And the reason you're doing that is not because of white men, but really because of brown men. So if you tried to hold your event in a mosque, mm -hmm. the violence and intimidation with which you'd be met because of brown men would lead you to have to call the police, mm -hmm. and it would be white policemen who would be defending you against those brown men. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to give you... I want to give you two quick examples. Can, 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 I, can I just get into that, just to be devil's advocate, because yeah. I, 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 I totally hear what you're saying, but isn't this um, opposition against white men and uh, against the patterns that they represent, it's not about their individuality, but the patterns they represent, isn't that a necessary phase in emancipation? So you have to um, direct your um, activism towards a certain group in order to find the strength. It's not maybe very nuanced, but it's a necessary step. Uh, again, devil's advocate, how would you react so to that? I agree, it's, it's not nuanced, and I wouldn't say, I, and I'd suggest it's unnecessary. I think actually what you need to do is establish the universality of human rights that you're committed to, and then we all get included in that conversation to achieve those rights. Hmm. So I don't care. <laughs> We haven't got time for this, guys. Like, there's so many of us. So um, thank you, but thank you. So, um, so I don't care, as the speaker said prior to me, I don't care if you're a white man, but actually, uh, if you're committed towards my rights as a gay man within the Muslim community and wider society, that's all that matters to me, and let's fight for those rights together.